Hello and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jenny Eastwood and today's case is a crazy one. I mean I know they're all crazy but I had originally had another case planned and then I watched an episode of Deadly Women and this story came up and I thought that it was kind of too good not to pass up so I have changed tack and today's story is about a Canadian woman and her German boyfriend. Now if you're new here, uh, hi, I post new videos every week about a true crime case from somewhere around the world. So if you like true crime, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button because I'm sure you will not be disappointed. Anyway, without further ado, let's get into today's case. Elizabeth Roxanne Haysom was born on April 15th, 1964 in Rhodesia, South Africa, which is now called Harare in Zimbabwe. She was born to parents Derek Haysom, who was a high-flying steel executive in Nova Scotia, Canada, and mother Nancy Haysom, who was from a well-to-do Virginian family and she was an artist. Elizabeth was the youngest of all her siblings. Derek and Nancy had five children between them from previous marriages, but Elizabeth was the only one that they had together. She was the baby of the family. She was 10 years younger than the next sibling above her. So she kind of got away with a lot. And I guess, I don't know, there's something about the youngest sibling who sometimes, you know, can be a little, uh, little needy and she definitely was she demanded a lot from her parents and they found it kind of quite hard to deal with her so they wanted elizabeth to have the best chance at life as possible so they decided to send her to wycombe abbey boarding school about an hour northwest of london initially when she got there elizabeth had quite a bit of trouble settling in she was pretty peeved off that she'd been sent to the school but after a couple of years she sort of found her groove she actually really enjoyed the traditions and mannerisms of being in england and she really leaned into the arts and theater and she was a very good writer. So she really found her place in Waiko. Elizabeth stuck to a really strict regime of schoolwork. So she had a social life, but she took her arts and music interests very, very seriously. However, that all turned to custard in her final years of schooling when her parents, Derek and Nancy, decided to enroll her in high level science and mathematics classes because they wanted her to pursue the same career path as her father. They wanted her to become an engineer. But Nancy didn't want to become an engineer. She wanted to pursue a career in the arts. So she was peeved off about this and actually ended up flunking all of her classes in her final year of school. So that meant she had to resit her final year. Because of this, Elizabeth started to develop a deep, deep resentment for her parents. She blamed them for the fact that she had failed so badly this far and she didn't like that they kept trying to force her to do what they wanted to do and follow in the footsteps of her father. Elizabeth started to rebel against her parents and began getting in quite a bit of trouble at school. During this period of rebellion, Elizabeth was accused of having drugs at school. A few of the girls at the school had been caught with them and they blamed Elizabeth. Apparently they thought that it would be easy to pin it on the foreign girl and they, the school believed them. So Elizabeth was punished and part of her punishment was that she was not allowed any access to the telephone, meaning that she was not in contact with her parents at all for quite a while. Because of this, like combined with the pressure her parents were putting on her, she actually ran away from her boarding school for five whole months. She did end up coming back to Wycombe Abbey though, but by the time she got back, most of her friends had moved on. She was stuck repeating the school year and she was peeved off. It was like her teenage angst was really starting to boil and bubble combined with, you know, feeling like a bit of an outsider and not doing well in her grades and it was all really starting to come to a bit of a head. With all this time that she had alone to herself, Elizabeth started to brood over all of the injustices that she felt she'd been subjected to because of her parents. Among these incidences, she said she was raped at the age of 10 at a school that she attended in Switzerland. She claimed that her parents completely ignored this incident and didn't take any action. She also said that she was attacked by another boy in Nova Scotia when she was at her father's workplace. 
Although later, it turned out that Elizabeth had actually massively exaggerated some of these incidents. The rape allegation turned out to be an experience of indecent exposure, which is still really terrible. And the physical assault that she said she was victim to, she claimed that she'd had both her front teeth knocked out during the assault after having her head slammed against a brick wall. But it was very clear that she still had her two natural teeth and she didn't even really have a scar. She had just a small scar on her chin. So it seemed to others that she may have been lying about the seriousness of that attack. During her last year in boarding school, Elizabeth started experimenting with drugs and exploring her sexuality a little bit more. Being 1983, it was not a great time to be experimenting with girls openly and so Elizabeth was actually expelled from high school for the relationship she was having with one of the other students. Her expulsion from boarding school meant that she would not get accepted into the Trinity College that she wanted to attend and her girlfriend that she was seeing at the time was rejected from Oxford University. So both with their futures completely in tatters, the two women decided to just throw caution to the wind and kind of go on a wild goose chase all over Europe. From July 1983 until October, the two girls survived by stealing food, selling their blood, engaging in sex work, sleeping in strangers' apartments and homes, all while traveling through France, Italy, and Germany. During this time, Elizabeth's parents were obviously freaking out and really concerned about her well-being, and so they actually reached out and got Interpol involved to try and track down Elizabeth and bring her back home to the UK. Eventually, they did manage to find her, and Elizabeth and her girlfriend wound up at the British Embassy begging for tickets back home to Britain. When Elizabeth got home to her parents' house, she showed up with a shocking mohawk haircut and a very, very bad attitude. Derek and Nancy were kind of beside themselves at this point. They were very exasperated with Elizabeth's behavior. They didn't really know what more they could do to try and control her. And so when Derek was offered a job in Virginia in the United States, he thought this was an awesome opportunity for the family to relocate and maybe start fresh, hopefully removing Elizabeth from all of these bad memories, these bad influences would help set her on the right path. He thought that she'd had a good, she would have a good shot at getting into the University of Virginia and maybe continue on to become an engineer or something. So Elizabeth went along with her parents, but she was not happy about it. She felt that this was just another example of her parents trying to control her life and make her do what they wanted her to do. However, in 1984, miraculously, Elizabeth was actually accepted and enrolled into the University of Virginia. But much the same as things had been for her back in London, she had a bit of trouble fitting in with her classmates. She was a bit odd, she had this international background, but then she met Jens Soering. Jens was a German-born 18-year-old who was the son of a German diplomat. Jens was not a supermodel, he was kind of small and squirrely and a lot of other students were put off by him because he was very arrogant and very open in his support of Nazism, which Jens is, that's not cool bro. He had a bit of a baby face and he had also had quite an international background with his parents who traveled a lot for work. Jens was born in Bangkok to a West German diplomat and his wife. He played in a rock band called Ground Zero and he had dreams of becoming a filmmaker. Jens spent his teen years in Atlanta, where his father was the vice consul in the West German consulate. Jens was also extremely smart. He was a Jefferson Scholar, which was an award given to just 18 international students every single year. It was the school's most prestigious award, in fact. Unlike other scholarships, this one was a full scholarship, meaning that all of his university fees would be covered. So because the two were quite similar, Elizabeth had an international background, she spoke with a slight British accent, she had this shock of long blonde hair that kind of attracted people, she was a little mysterious, she would like stand in the courtyard smoking cigarettes and like looking all interesting and mysterious and Jens was very curious about Elizabeth. But she was the last person you would think would end up with a person like Jens. 
So initially when Elizabeth met Jens, yeah, she thought he was like a little bit wimpy and weedy, but the more the two spoke, it, the more they learned that they had in common and shared similar ideas about life and philosophy and art and writing. They both also shared a resentment for Americans in general and their own families. Elizabeth would spend hours telling Jens about all the injustices she'd faced in her family and how she felt assaulted by her parents and that instead of them helping her, they'd simply send her away to a boarding school. She told Jens about her expulsion from Wycombe Alley and how she'd run away to explore Europe with her girlfriend. He told Elizabeth about how his very strict maternal grandmother had refused to give his mother money to divorce his strict controlling father. He felt very put out by this and felt that they deserved a portion of her money. Jens was particularly appalled when Elizabeth told him of an occasion where she'd returned home and her mother had forced her to strip her clothes off and take photos of her naked for the sake of art. And according to Elizabeth, it wasn't the first time she'd been used by her mother. When Jens asked her how she managed to live with abuse like that, she said that she had learned to cope with it but that she held on to a secret wish. She said that she wished they were dead. Now, Nancy and Derek didn't like Jens from the minute they laid eyes on him. They found him to be arrogant and cynical, and they also found that he just seemed to fuel Elizabeth's bad behavior. With Jens, Elizabeth only continued to be more dramatic and exaggerate things even more, and they were honestly tired of Elizabeth's behavior. So obviously they thought this was a bad match. And they certainly didn't hide their feelings about Jens from Elizabeth. They told her bluntly that they didn't like him and that they thought she should keep an open mind to all the other boys that might be out there. They said that there are plenty more fish in the sea and that Elizabeth would find someone that she was better suited to be with. Elizabeth, however, was not gonna change her mind. She told them that she loved Jens and that there was nobody else she wanted to be with. Elizabeth, though, also didn't keep her parents' feelings a secret from Jens. She would go, whenever she was with him, she would tell him all the terrible things that her parents had said about him and how they didn't want them to be together and they were interfering with their love. And all of this only continued to make Jens become more and more angry towards her parents also. And then things really kind of reached a tipping point because Elizabeth's parents told her that if she did not stop seeing Jens, they would cut her off financially. That meant she would stop receiving any money or any help from her parents. And during school, Elizabeth and Jens would write each other letters. And in these secret letters, they would detail out a plan and, des and the desires that they shared to kill her parents. They needed them out of the picture so that the two of them could be together and live happily ever after. Elizabeth and Jens, just three months into their relationship, had it all worked out. And on March 30th, 1985, they set their plan in motion. Jens and Elizabeth rented a car and drove from Charlottesville, Virginia, which is where their university was, to Washington, DC. They had booked a room at the Marriott Hotel. This is where Elizabeth got to work setting up an alibi. She bought movie tickets to two or three different films. She ordered room service for two people. She forged Yen's signature on a credit card receipt. And she placed calls where she pretended that she was talking to Yen's. Meanwhile, Yen's drove the car from Washington DC back to her parents' home that her mother called Loose Chippings about a 600 kilometer round trip. Later, the two would say that he had gone to see her parents to have a heart-to-heart -heart and hopefully bring them round and convince them that Jens and Elizabeth should be together and that they wanted to have her parents' blessings. After 8pm that evening, there was a knock on the door of Nancy and Derek's home. They were very surprised because it was a very late hour and they were actually in the middle of having dinner. When they opened the door, they found Jens on the doorstep. They asked where Elizabeth was and Jens told them that he'd come alone and this was quite a surprise because they'd actually never met Jens in their home before. Nevertheless, they invited him in and offered him drinks and a place at the dinner table. According to Jens, Derek and Nancy were drinking when he arrived. They offered him several stiff drinks on top of the multiple beers that he had drunk on the way down for a little bit of Dutch courage. Jens later said that Derek spent most of the conversation outlining the plans that he and Nancy had for Elizabeth's life and how Jens was not part of them. 
Derek then very bluntly told Jens that if he insisted on continuing to see his daughter, he would ensure that he got kicked out of university. Jens obviously took exception to this and stood abruptly from his chair. Apparently at this time, Derek also rose from his chair and told him to sit down, young man, but Jens did not. The conversation quickly escalated into a hysterical screaming match and Jens suddenly pulled a knife out of his pocket and slashed Derek across his throat. Nancy, having just witnessed this attack on her husband, ran to the kitchen to try and get help. She went to grab a knife so she could come back and defend her husband. Unfortunately, Jens followed her, ripped the knife out of her hand and slit her throat. She unfortunately collapsed on the kitchen floor. Jens returned to Derek, who was still fighting for his life. He was struggling to his feet, trying to make his way towards the front door while fighting off Jens. Jens frantically stabbed him, trying to overpower him, and later he said that the man just wouldn't lay down and die. They continued on a vicious, vicious bloodbath, and finally Derek did stop fighting. He had been stabbed 48 times, including 14 in the back, and this is a bit grisly, he had been nearly decapitated. Jens obviously won the match, but he had seriously wounded his left hand in the struggle. Both Derek and Nancy had been nearly decapitated due to the wounds on their necks. Apparently, Derek had been cut almost to the spine. When all was said and done, Derek lay in a pool of blood in the middle of the floor. After the killings, Jens removed all of his clothes that he had been wearing and had blood on them and started to clean up everything he thought he had touched to try and remove all fingerprint evidence and any signs that he had been there. He threw all his bloody clothes in a trash bag in a dumpster and then went and cleaned up all of the blood around, kind of smearing it in circles to cover up any footprints. So as you can see in some of the crime scene photos, it's just like smeared blood everywhere. As he left the Hastings house, he noticed that the front porch light was still on and he was worried that it might attract attention. So he went back inside the house to try and find the switch and turn it off. He was wearing just socks at this time because he'd taken off his bloody shoes and he couldn't find the switch near the front door, which, you know, you might logically conclude that the switch would be. The switch was actually in the master bedroom. So he ended up leaving and leaving the light on. When he was finally satisfied with his cleanup job, Jens left the house and drove all the way back to Washington DC. When he arrived at the Marriott Hotel where he was staying with Elizabeth, he had no pants on because he'd had to throw them away because they were covered in blood. Elizabeth had grown tired of waiting for Jens and instead of seeing all three movies that she'd intended to see that she bought tickets for, she was waiting for Jens in the hotel room. Now the two were stoked. The deed was done and they were free to be together and presumably Elizabeth would inherit a small amount of money also from the death of her parents. Three days later, the bodies of Nancy and Derek were discovered on April the 3rd, 1965. A close friend of the family, Annie Massey, had gone over. She would regularly play games of bridge with Nancy and Derek, and when she showed up at their house and they didn't answer the door, she thought that that was very, very strange. So she got in touch with a neighbor who had a spare key to the home and let herself in. There, sadly, she discovered an absolutely horrific scene and the bodies of her two friends. Annie immediately called the police. When investigators arrived on the scene, they were totally puzzled. They had no idea who would have motive to kill the Haysims in such a violent manner. There were no signs of forced entry, there was nothing stolen, and there were no signs of sexual assault. So what the heck? And it appeared that the Haysims had let their killer in voluntarily because no forced entry. Obviously, the first place that investigators looked were at the Haysims' own family. As they started to speak to extended family members, they began to learn about the difficulties that Nancy and Derek had been having with their daughter Elizabeth. When they spoke to Elizabeth about this, when they confronted her with the fact that they learned about her trip to Europe and her bizarre behavior, she behaved very strangely during the interviews. Investigators were kind of like, they had, you know, little like alarm bells ringing. They thought that Elizabeth and 
again seemed pretty weird but obviously being weird doesn't make you a murderer so they needed a little bit more evidence than that to investigate them any further. But that didn't take long because the more they spoke to the family and to Elizabeth, the more convinced they became that Elizabeth was involved in the murder of her parents. And honestly, her half-siblings kind of started to believe the same thing after Elizabeth began leading the police on a wild goose chase of possible suspects, alleged missing items, and accusing her mother of sexual molestation. A local man named Donald Harrington actually came forward and said that he had seen Jens with a bruise on his face and a heavily bandaged hand at the reception following the funeral of Elizabeth's parents. Now another issue that Elizabeth and Jens had to explain to the police is that when they told the police of their alibi, how they had been in Washington DC the night of the attack, what they hadn't taken into consideration is that the rental car that they had borrowed would show the additional 600 kilometers on the odometer. So when police asked them to explain this, they didn't really have a good explanation for it other than saying that they had gotten lost repeatedly. But that's a lot of getting lost. Like 600 kilometers is a, is a really, really long way. That's like, honestly, that's like uh, eight hours of getting lost. So that's a bit of a stretch. I feel like if you were getting lost that much, you'd probably stop and ask for directions or something. I don't know. But even with like all of the circumstantial evidence, Elizabeth and Jens like stuck to their alibi that they were in Washington and had nothing to do with it. They just wouldn't budge. So at this stage, investigators had very little to go on. They didn't really have any physical evidence. No fingerprints were found from Elizabeth or Jens at the crime scene. And a luminal test on the rental car that Elizabeth and Jens had borrowed showed no signs of blood either. And then sadly, the hotel manager of the Marriott later told police that the security camera that they had at the time in 1985 was being reviewed like real time by a security officer and actually wasn't being recorded so there was no footage that police could review and see like was Jens telling the truth or was he actually showing up at the hotel at the time he would have if he'd committed this murder. So at the crime scene one piece of evidence that the police had found was a bloody sock print which would later prove to be pretty vital in the story. However, the real trump card that the police had is that they knew that Elizabeth and Jens didn't know what they had on them. They didn't know if they'd found any fingerprints or DNA or blood or anything. And so police chose to keep this information pretty close to their chest to keep the pressure on the two in case they decided to crack. So as the investigation progressed, more and more suspects were excluded. This meant that investigators began to zero in more and more on Jens and Elizabeth, even more than they already were. On October 6, 1985, during an interview, Jens continued to deny any involvement in the crime. And at this time, police asked him for a blood sample to exclude him from the investigation. They said that Elizabeth had happily given hers and would he mind giving his. After bringing an FBI profiler in, the profiler had deduced that the attack looked like it could have been committed by a female perpetrator, especially one who knew the two very well due to the violent nature of the attack. They also thought that it might have been a female because they thought it unlikely that Nancy would open the door to a man while she was in her bathrobe. On being asked to provide his blood, fingerprints and footprints to rule him out of the investigation, Jens refused, saying his family could be deported if he was tied to a murder case. Hun, you're already tied to a murder case. So instead of, you know, going along with the investigation, Jens emptied his bank accounts, cleared his apartment of all fingerprints and his car, and fled the United States on October 13th, 1985, just a week after being asked to provide exculpatory evidence to police. He also forfeited all of his scholarships by doing this. Obviously, his flight propelled him to the top of the suspect list, and shortly after, Elizabeth actually joined him. Together, they lived under assumed names and bummed around Asia and Europe for months and months, living on odd jobs and petty fraud. But Jens and Elizabeth were spotted at a Marks and Spencer store in the Richmond area of London. 
they were carrying out some of their fraud activity at that time where they were making exchanges for cash and then writing out bad checks to buy new products. This is how they'd been making their money. They would buy an expensive product using a check and then exchange the product for cash, but the original money like didn't exist. So, and the whole time the two of them were pretending not to know each other. However, their behavior was suspicious enough to arouse the attention of a security guard who followed them around the store. The security guard reported their suspicious behavior to the police and an officer came in to talk to them. Why does this always happen that like these criminal masterminds get caught doing something so dumb like, you know, Ted Bunny with the speeding ticket? I just, yeah, anyway. Uh, while being questioned by the police, they asked if they would consent to a search of their flat and incredibly, the two actually agreed to it. The search of their apartment would uncover their actual genuine passports with their real names and identities, driver's license, birth certificates, but the most damning evidence of all, they actually found handwritten letters that Elizabeth had wrote to Jens seemingly about the murders of her parents that the two had carried out together. Elizabeth and Jens had like started a joint travel diary where they would write messages to each other about their whole Bonnie and Clyde escape from the law adventure that they were on. When reading through these diaries, detectives found Jens bizarre fantasies, veiled references to some kind of violent crime, and suspicious references to fingerprints. There was also a very suspicious entry in Elizabeth's handwriting dated October the 12th, 1985, the day before Jens fled the country. Quote, the case is about to be solved. Perhaps fingerprints on a coffee mug used by Jens in a Bedford interview gave him away, unquote. Eventually, investigators managed to piece together the information and placed a call to the authorities in Bedford, Virginia, the county where the Hayson murders had been committed. Faye Massey was a secretary at the Sheriff's Office in Bedford County in 1986 when she answered a call from British authorities. She said they asked, have you got an unsolved murder? And she could hardly contain her excitement and she said, hold on, I'll get the Sheriff. Pretty much immediately, investigators from Bedford County flew to London to interrogate Elizabeth and Jens. They were being held in custody on fraud charges and were formally questioned about the murders of the Haysoms. Jens was allowed to speak to his lawyer and to the German embassy on June 5th, the first day of his questioning. Weirdly, Jens waived his right to a lawyer and even wrote it in handwriting that he understood his rights and voluntarily answered the investigator's questions. And then incredibly over the next four days of his interrogation, Jens actually confessed. He told the police everything about how he and Elizabeth had planned this alibi and how he had driven by himself to loose chippings to murder Elizabeth's parents. Without any prompting from investigators, he provided evidence and answered questions that only the perpetrator of the crime could know. All of his confessions were preserved on audio tape. Elizabeth Hayson voluntarily returned to the United States in 1987. Before her trial began, she actually pled guilty to accessory before the fact in the murder of her parents. This meant no trial for Elizabeth and at sentencing, she told the court that although she knew that Jens intended to kill her parents, she didn't think he would actually go through with it. Elizabeth, 23 at the time, was sentenced to 90 years in prison for the murder of her parents. She was incarcerated at the Fluvanna Correctional Center for Women in Troy, Virginia. Jens' story though is a little bit more complicated and honestly his whole thing could be like a two-parter but I wanted to keep it like pretty simple for this video because honestly it like a little bit annoys me that the whole entire story has just become about Jens. If you look it up online, you will know what I mean. Jens was initially charged with capital murder, but he fought extradition to the United States hard. The battle lasted for three years, and at one point he was even backed by the European Court of Human Rights. The UK really didn't want to extradite him because they knew that he would be put to death, and they'd abolished the death penalty like a very long time ago, and felt that it was inhumane and cruel punishment. 
So until they were convinced that the United States would not execute Jens, they did not want to send him back to the US. So when the agreement was met that Jens would not be given the death penalty, he was actually extradited back to begin his trial. By the time his trial began in 1990, Jens had completely changed his story from his original confession. Jens said that he, not Elizabeth, had stayed at the hotel in Washington DC and that she was the one who'd driven back to Virginia to murder her parents. He said that Elizabeth hated her parents and that his false confession back in London was just an attempt to protect her from the full extent of the law. He said that he thought that by taking the blame he would save her from the electric chair and that he would, if found guilty, be likely extradited back to Germany where he would do time in like a lower security prison for less years. Also, some people speculate that he confessed so easily because maybe he thought because he was the son of a diplomat he would have immunity from prosecution, you know, but found out he didn't and maybe if he knew that he actually wasn't able to get immunity for this charge he wouldn't have confessed at all and maybe that's actually why he even carried out the murder because he thought he wouldn't get in trouble for it. But again, that is just speculation, but I do actually believe that that is potentially like quite a good reason why he was so forthcoming with the information. His trial lasted three weeks and at the end, Jens was served two life sentences. Since then, he has spent pretty much every single day trying to convince people of his innocence. He said he really thought that he would only end up spending 10 years behind bars and that that was worth it to save Elizabeth's life. However, shortly after their arrest, Elizabeth actually broke up with Jens and she also told authorities that Jens was responsible for the murders. Jens said that for the first 15 years of his time spent in a maximum security prison, he felt like he was also the victim of a mentally ill person. Since he's been behind bars, Jens has been working diligently away to construct an alternative version of history. And honestly, this reminds me a lot of the David Bain case, uh, you know, where I feel like, I mean, I don't, I've done a lot of research on this story and I know what I've, you know, read in all these reports, but it does feel similar that he has basically convinced himself of his own innocence or maybe he really is like a true sociopath who has no issue with lying to huge amounts of people and perpetuating this lie for 30 odd years. But during his work trying to like get himself exonerated, it actually is incredible how far he managed to take it. He was writing to Angela Merkel who actually raised his case with Barack Obama when she visited the United States one time. Not only that, but the former president of Germany visited Jens in prison and pled with American officials for his release. Dozens of members of the German and EU parliaments have petitioned with the state of Virginia for Jens to have a full pardon or to at least allow him to serve the rest of his sentence in Germany. This is just crazy to me, right? Like, the man confessed and his blood type was found at the crime scene. But the man confessed and they are still saying he deserves a full pardon. Like, I don't know, at the very least if he was like, okay, say he is telling the truth and Elizabeth is the one who actually committed the crime and he was the one who was in Washington, he fully conspired to make that happen. He upheld that alibi, he didn't report it to the police, he fled when he was under investigation, like he committed fraud. Why does this man deserve a full pardon? But here is where we are today. So despite being handed two life sentences, on November the 25th, 2019, so just like two years ago, after rejecting 14 parole requests from Jens and many other routes of extradition, so like, you know, allowing him to return to Germany, both Jens and Elizabeth were paroled, conditional of their respective deportations to Canada and Germany. When Jens landed in Frankfurt, he was welcomed by an army of supporters who were celebrating his return. Jens was just 19 when he was put behind bars and he spent 33 years in prison. 
As part of his conditions of parole, Jens is not allowed to re-enter the United States ever again, nor is he allowed to make any contact with the family of the Hastings, including Elizabeth. Elizabeth, who was 23 at the time of the crimes, is now 57. She has managed to maintain a very, very low profile since the murders actually took place. And honestly, for all intents and purposes, she kind of just like has done the best thing you can do as a guilty person in this sort of situation. She pled guilty, she accepted her sentence, she expressed genuine remorse for the murders of her parents. She's never sought publicity for her crimes, she's never tried to profit off what she did, and she spent most of her time in prison finishing up her education and focusing on her written work, so good for her. At least now, I don't know what she'll be up to now, but I don't know, I always wonder, like, with these people who go to jail so young and have commit such terrible crimes at such a young age, like, how do you, like, be in jail for that long and then go on and have a normal life, sort of, yeah. Anyway, that is the case I have for you guys today. It is a very complicated one. Uh, there is a ton of information out there surrounding the DNA tests. Something I'm not sure I mentioned was that the crime scene, obviously DNA is was very much in its infancy when at the time of the crime back in the 1980s. And when they were testing for blood, they found blood that matched the type of Nancy and Derek, obviously, obviously. And they also found O-type blood, which was Yen's blood type, and type B, which was Elizabeth's blood type. And type B is very, very rare, so that was quite a surprise and would actually suggest that there was a third person, a well, second person, Elizabeth, at the house at the time. Although she's never said anything to that effect and we don't know for sure. And Yen's blood type, it was never conclusively linked to him through DNA, but like, let's just, you know, think about that for a second. What are the odds that two people with the same blood type killed the two, that killed Derek and Nancy? And that it wasn't Elizabeth and Jens. I don't know, it just seems like a little bit too far-fetched for me. My personal, I don't know, but then something else that one of the lead investigators said is that when he met Jens, he did not believe that this teeny tiny weedy little nerd was capable of such a horrendous and violent crime, but I think the guy sounds like a weirdo, like the two of them were writing each other all sorts of love letters and I would not be surprised if he saw himself as some kind of struggling, tormented artist and that he had all this rage inside of him and he had to get it out and so, you know, people can do insane things and I think that having an idea of what a violent criminal looks like in your head is a very dangerous game. And also we know that Derek Hayson was a heavy drinker, so even though he was technically bigger than Jens, it is not beyond the realm of possibility that he was too drunk really to defend himself and it was easy for Jens to overpower him. I guess we'll never know, but you know, I mean, he is free now and good for him and he can go on and do whatever he wants and fight for his freedom, but I did hear that he had signed over the rights to his story to Netflix and he'd been paid in advance and that Germany were going to create a documentary about him. And then some new DNA evidence came out that did not shine favorably upon Jens and his, his, his guilt has recently been called into question again. So after that, he kind of stopped working with Netflix and now it's unsure whether or not this project is going to go ahead. So. I don't know, I think the dude is guilty as hell, and maybe one day the truth will come out, but I don't know, at least he gets to go on and live his life, I don't think he's a threat to the general population, probably would never have done it if he hadn't met Elizabeth, so I don't know, it doesn't seem like Elizabeth's a threat either, and she will just go on to live a merry life too, good for her though for not sort of capitalising on this terrible crime that she participated in. Anyway, please let me know what your thoughts are if you're still with me. Thanks for watching. Um, have you heard of this case? I saw it first on Deadly Woman. I love a good Deadly Woman episode. I love a good 
murderous female story. I know that's two in a row now I've done. Last week was Tracy Wigginton, this who I also actually got inspiration from, from Deadly Women. And yeah, this week Elizabeth Hazem. So do let me know what you think. Do you think that she participated in this crime? Do you think that Jens is innocent? If you've heard of the story, let me know in the comment section below. Um, if all my sources are linked in the description box too, if you want to go on and do some more investigating of your own. Otherwise, thanks for sticking with me and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye.